On Point with Craig's Investment Partners. The information provided here is general in nature. It's not financial advice. It doesn't take into account your financial situation, objectives, goals or risk tolerance. All investments are subject to risks and none are guaranteed. So before you make any investment decisions, we recommend you contact an investment advisor. For more information about our services in that regard, you can go to our website, which is craigsip.com. Welcome to On Point. I'm Mark Lister, Investment Director at Craig's Investment Partners, and I'll be talking about a range of topics, including economics, portfolio strategy, investor education, and anything else that's happening out there in financial markets. Today, I wanted to talk about just how strong the US share market has been so far in 2023, and how that has really surprised a lot of people. We didn't have many people at the start of the year who were predicting such a a fantastic performance. So if you're feeling a little baffled by that, or if you're a bit confused about, geez, where could things go next after such a surprisingly strong first six or seven months of the year, you're not alone. So don't feel bad. Even the experts are very unsure. What we've seen in recent times is that the range of predictions from all the Wall Street forecasters about how the rest of the year will play out, that's blown out to being the widest in decades, actually, which really tells you that uh, people don't have a good handle uh, on where things might go next. And I think... I think part of the reason for that, a big part of the reason, is that all of these Wall Street forecasters have been well and truly caught off guard this year. Um, Very few of them saw the market being as strong as it has been, and that strength has really taken people by surprise. I I sat down uh, in early January and I went through all of the... All of the uh, forecasts for the the annual return for the S and P five hundred index in the US for the year. You know, start of the year, a lot of these big uh, Wall Street banks and um, strategists and financial firms, you know, J P Morgan and Wells Fargo and Credit Suisse and Citigroup, UBS, uh, all of those big behemoths, uh, they put out their outlook um, strategy reports, and they all have a target for where the market will go. And that sort of um, is a function of their view of the the economy, um, what interest rates will do, what inflation will do, will we have a recession, will we not, what will earnings do, um, how will market sentiment look, you know, and they basically sort of come down to a a forecast for what um, the index will do. And the S&P 500 ended last year at uh, about 3,800, um, points, 38.40, um, we're just shy of that to be precise. And of the 14 uh, forecasts that I was able to find from all of those major firms, uh, the average forecast was for the S&P 500 to finish the year at 4.070. So it started at 38.40, it was meant to finish at 4.070. So that was an average return that was being forecast of about Six percent. So a reasonably, a reasonably modest return return was what people were uh, picking. That's for the whole year, for all of 2023. Now we sit here in mid July, and the S and P 500 is up 18 um, percent. So you know the average was six. We're already up 18 percent, well ahead of where every strategist was picking it, it to finish the year, and we're only sort of six and a half months in. So it's been a a fantastic return that has surprised just about everyone. The only bank uh, and strategy team that came anywhere near that was Deutsche Bank. Um, they picked uh, the the S and P five hundred to end the year at forty five hundred points, and it's at forty five twenty seven uh, right now. So they're pretty close. Um, uh, that was a seventeen percent uh, return that they were picking, and they were well and truly. Uh, the most optimistic, um, but no one else sort of was even in the ballpark. Then again, um, these market forecasts, we should all take them with a grain of salt. Um, looking at 2022, uh, no one in that group, that same group, um, did the same exercise in 2022. No one picked the market to fall nearly 20%. You know, the average forecast for 2022 
was for the S and P five hundred to rise about four percent, just shy of four percent of the fourteen firms uh, whose forecasts I look, looked at. Only three of them, uh, only three of them uh, picked a negative return. The other eleven picked a positive return, and the average term was meant to be you know plus four came in at minus 19.4. So uh, they got it wrong last year. Uh, in fact, Deutsche Bank, who's been right this year, you know, they were one of, were one of the most wrong last year because they were quite optimistic last year as well. And ironically, uh, the firm that was the closest last year was Morgan Stanley. They were the most negative. They had a, a return of um, minus 8%. So they were the most cautious, the most bearish, uh, and therefore the closest. Uh, and they've actually been one of the most wrong this year because they've stayed somewhat cautious. So, you know, that's a lesson in itself, isn't it? You know, um, uh, you can be completely off the mark one year and then um, completely on the money uh, the next year. So, look, take those forecasts with a grain of salt. I'm not actually here to sort of, you know, nitpick about whether people have got their forecasts right. It's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek way to simply point out that it's a, a bit of a mugs game anyway to try and predict where the market's going to go next, no matter how many PhDs or CFAs you've got in your analyst team, no matter how good you are at sort of building a beautiful spreadsheet model, uh, it's a near impossible task to try and predict uh, market moves, uh, especially in the short term. And um, I think we should just consider these forecasts for what they are. They're a bit of a it's a bit of a marketing angle to be able to build your story around and produce some thought-provoking research that will, will hopefully give your clients a feel for what you think and why. And it's it's often not, not about whether you're right or wrong. I, I sort of think of these market forecasts the way, um, uh, the same way I do about sort of target prices for individual stocks. You know, you have um, company analysts or stock analysts will uh release their research and it will have um target prices you know fisher and pike healthcare or csl across the tasman or microsoft in the us here's the target price it's where we think it's going to over the next however long six months 12 months Th those aren't particularly useful to me you know when i read those analyst reports i learn a lot um but the target price is actually the least useful thing uh on that page because uh, what I'm really trying to to gain is 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 an edge uh, or a, or an angle that I might not have thought of, um, and that's that's what those analysts are really trying to provide to their clients as well. They're trying to make them look at a company or an opportunity a little bit differently, um, maybe add sort of a tidbit of information about what the business is doing or what it could do that that client or that reader might not have thought of. They're not actually sort of selling that target price and that prediction. And um, I suspect most fund managers who those stock reports are really written for don't find those target prices very useful either. And, and quite often, the analyst who is completely off base in terms of his or her target price um, about where that stock goes can still provide a great service to that client, to that fund manager, to that reader. Um, because there's all these other things that they are trying to convey in those reports. And it's kind of the same when we think about these index forecasts. They're not, they're not something to sort of hang your head on and build a strategy around. So um, uh, let, let's just get that straight. But I think it is really telling um, that you've got sort of what, such a wide disparity of targets and views out there. That's sort of the main point that I'm trying to make is that uh, people don't sort of have a good feel for where things are going, and I find that I find that really interesting, even among the experts. It makes me feel a little better, bit better that I haven't got a perfectly calibrated crystal ball, um, because neither has has Wall Street. So what you see now at the halfway mark, with many people being having been proven quite wrong, is that you've got uh, an even wider range of views out there. Some of those forecasters are sticking to their guns. Some of those ones that had sort of quite a, a cautious view at the start of the year, they're, they're, they've dug in, they've still got that cautious view. And you've got others that have just thrown in the towel and said, oh, look, you know, got that dead wrong. Let's just revise the forecast. Then our forecast, you know, won't won't be wrong. We'll just have a new one. So let's just ramp it up and um, reflect this more upbeat, more positive mood of the market. So they've just revised theirs 
uh, a lot higher. So now all of a sudden, you know, they look like they are, are sort of closer to where things are at. And so now you've got a situation where looking through to the end of the year, you know, we've still got sort of five and a half, six odd months to go through to the end of the year. And when you look at that range of forecasts, and this is Bloomberg figures, because they uh, monitor all this data and they sort of collate it, the gap between uh, the highest S&P 500 index target and the lowest, so the mo most optimistic forecaster and the most cautious, that's blown out to be the widest in, in, in about 20 odd years. So I think, find that really interesting that looking out across the balance of the year, uh, the most optimistic firm sees another rise of almost 10%. You know, the market's already up sort of, you know, 15, 17, 18%. Uh, year to date and someone out there sees another 10% gain that'd be fantastic we'll all enjoy that wouldn't we uh, the most cautious person and that'll be someone who has stuck to their guns and kept their cautious view they started the year with is implying a 25% decline from here so you know take your pick about who you want to listen to Th those are the two extremes and you'll have a whole bunch of people that are sort of more in the middle but Still, the average forecast points to a double digit. So in other words, a 10% um, decline between now and the end of the year, which is quite quite a negative view. You know, in fact, um, Bloomberg says that that is the most negative second half view that, that they've had. Um, and I've been tracking this stuff for, for a long time. And since at least 1999, which is probably when they started tracking it, uh, that's the most negative view out there. So you've, you've really got um, quite a disparity with where the market is at and where the, the experts, the pros, the, the, the Wall Street strategists um, see things going. So current sentiment is really at odds with those expert opinions. I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, as is always the case. You know, right now... Um, Right now, you've certainly got more good news than bad. Um, you've had that US inflation rate. We got these figures last week. Um, headline US inflation back to 3%. That is amazing. That is a huge achievement. Uh, a year ago, it hit a 41-year high of 9.1%. So they've managed to pull it back from over 9 to 3. Core inflation still tracking higher. And the easy gains are behind us. A lot of that's oil and that sort of thing. So it's absolutely fair for people to point out that you've still got some really sticky parts of, of prices and inflation that will be harder to get a hold of. And I think, um, you know, that last mile, as they call it, of getting inflation from that 3 or 4% zone down to the, the 2% zone that the Fed would like to see, that will be a lot more of a challenge. So so the easy gains are behind us, and from here it gets a little bit more difficult. But it's still it's still fantastic news. And what that might mean is that the interest rate hike we're likely to see from the Federal Reserve next week, uh, next Thursday morning, I think it is, the 27th-ish of July, um, high chance that we'll see an interest rate hike then. But it might be the last one. So that might be it. And... That again would be a big milestone for the for the market. You know, in early 2022, the Federal Reserve started raising interest rates from close to zero, and it's it's moved aggressively. Uh, but it will be a fantastic turning point for confidence and sentiment uh, for us to have um, have a strong feeling that we were done, that we've seen the last of that, and that'd be good for the market as well. And um, all of that has happened while. Um, the economy has managed to hold its own you know we've managed to see that inflation fall back we've managed to see interest rates rise to where they need to be to be restrictive enough to put the brakes on and to get that inflation under control and unemployment's still low uh, corporate earnings has fallen but it hasn't tanked completely um, you've still got a very strong services sector in the us and the economy has proved to be fairly resilient so um, it's not it's not completely out of the realms of possibility that the Fed has actually managed to thread the needle reasonably well and deal with the situation without sort of uh, causing the wheels to fall off. Time will tell, um, but they've made some very good progress. And we know that fixed income and shares, uh, both both those asset classes tend to perform well 
when you see a central bank reach the top of the hill and pause. Um, I did some work on this a couple of months back. Uh, you can go back and look at this, look at the um, the report. You can listen to the podcast, and I'll talk you through what's happened in all the all the uh, monetary policy cycles over the last you know forty years. I think I went back in the US and twenty years in New Zealand, and the data is quite convincing that fixed income performs well in the six months, the twelve months, the twenty four months after a central bank pause. In fact, I couldn't find an example of when fixed income didn't perform well uh, in that sort of environment. Shares, it's a little bit murkier, um, sort of six out of 10 times, the share market will do well in the first six months, uh, over 12 months, over 24 months, you know, your hit rate's probably closer to 70 or 80%, but uh, it is an environment where asset prices can do well and financial markets can perform well, especially when you've got inflation slowing and when you've got economic activity uh, holding its own. And in that regard, the US economy is looking resilient. Um, it's pretty hard to see a major stumble over the balance of this year. A, a recession is still possible, some would say likely, but I, I just can't see it uh, in 2023. Maybe that'll be the case in 2024. Um, but over the over the next uh, four or five months, I, I just think the economy is too strong, to sort of uh, slow to that degree. So there, there are definitely some positives and some some good reasons for the market to be trading uh, the way it is uh, and in good shape. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, in the opposite corner, so to speak, you have still got the delayed impact of um, sharply higher borrowing costs to contend with. And we might not have seen the full impact there. There'd be a lot of people that would say, hang on, hang on, uh, give it time. You know, you, you have, you've you only seen interest rates start rising in, you know, whatever it was, March 2022. It's, it's only been just a little bit more than a year. You need to give it a good 18 months for things to actually start having an impact and that's fair. So maybe we just haven't seen the full brunt of the interest rate hikes that could be still to come. Uh, you've also got the the earning season. We're in the thick of that at the moment. So this is quite a crucial one, especially for a lot of those parts of the market that have um, been very strong and have lifted things higher. You know, the tech stocks, um, all of those growth companies performed very well. The bar is a lot higher for those in terms of, um, them being able to satisfy investor expectations plus you've just got higher valuations across the board and when you've got higher higher valuations across the market you know higher share prices that increases the likelihood of a, of either a pause you know the market runs out of puff because it's had a good run or you might get a pullback or a correction um, because you're sort of trading at a higher level in the first place which means you're going to be more sensitive to any bad news or any missing of expectations so Certainly a mixed bag. Um, what I would say is that because you've got some of those underlying positives, you've got an improving inflationary backdrop, you've got uh, an increasing likelihood that we've seen the last of the interest rate hikes and markets will be able to have confidence that we're sort of reaching a plateau. If you do get a pullback, if you do get a bit of weakness creep in, that could actually, more so than we've seen over the last little while, uh, that could see some buyers step in because there'll be people that have missed this rally that have that have watched the market go up sort of fifteen or twenty percent this year and they now feel like they've they've missed out they've they've missed their opportunity so those people will be sitting there with their sort of cash ready to go and if they see a bit of a pullback you know five percent ten percent even fifteen percent down uh, they might sort of be a bit more inclined to do some buying than they would have in the past because they've, they've um, they've got a bit more confidence about sort of the direction of travel. So that could limit any any sell-off. So I think when you look across the board, uh, pros and cons, you've still got a very cautious group of strategists and economists who are, are, are rightly, rightly sort of quite conservative in their thinking because there still are challenges out there. But you've got a very upbeat market that has proved a lot of people wrong. So... Um, it's up to all of us as investors to decide who we side with, you know, the, the conservative strategists or, you know, Mr. Market, as I would call it, which is really just a, uh, a term, um, Ben Graham coined that term sort of for, for the vibe that is out there, which is certainly much more upbeat. Or what I'm inclined to do is sort of hedge my bets and sort of take something from each of those opposing views and um, 
you know, end up sort of in the middle ground where I've got sort of a, a dollar each way. Um, but either way, you know, whichever side of the equation you're on, whether you sort of feel like you have 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 called this market right or wrong, um, if you are sitting there sort of a little unsure about where things go from here, we've had a good run, can it continue? Not sure. What you can do is you can take comfort in the knowledge that many of the pros are equally unsure where things might go next. So don't get too despondent if you're struggling to make sense of what has been a very pleasing year in terms of uh, returns and performance, but one that has caught a lot of people um, flat-footed, uh, even those that uh, do this for a living and are incredibly smart with big teams and a lot of resources at their disposal, uh, a lot of them have, have got things a little bit wrong as well, and they are as, as unsure as anyone in terms of the, the collective Wall Street strategist thinking about where things go next so you're not alone markets are difficult that's why um uh that's what makes them so interesting so we'll leave it there thanks for listening for more insights visit craigsip.com